Well, if you're new or if you've been out a couple weeks, we started a series three weeks ago called uh, just simply teaching through the book of James. And Pastor Chuck has done an incredible job. Pastor Tripp mentioned that Chuck is overseas visiting his daughter, uh, Amy and his son-in-law Ben and their grandkids. And uh, man, they're, they're having a blast over there. But man, it's just been a great, great series all about activating your faith. In fact, that's what he talked about on week one. And was this idea that James wrote this little book to say, hey, let's put our, our faith to work. Let's, let's activate our faith. And then in week two, last week, he talked about this idea that when we do something, we need to do it with the right motives. And the greatest motive to do anything from is from the motive of love. And so it's been super, super practical. And I would just encourage you, if something has stood out to you, if there's something you've taken away from the teaching so far, drop Pastor Chuck a note. I know that would be super encouraging if you just drop them an email, chuck at sugarhillchurch.com and just say, hey, here's something I took away from what you taught. It's been so good. Well, today, I just want to pick up where he left off and I want to talk about probably one of the biggest stressors that I know of. This thing that we're going to talk about today has gotten more of us in trouble than we would care to admit. It's caused more stress in our home. It's caused drama uh, at work. It's caused tension in our friendships. It's the thing that creates so many of our problems. And what's amazing is it's part of our body. Uh, most of our body doesn't get us in trouble. I've never gotten in trouble for having biceps. Nobody's been like, Bobby, you got the gun shows out. Uh, you're in trouble. For that. That's never, ha- why are you laughing at? That's never happened. <laughs> Thanks for your ministry. Uh, I've never gotten in trouble for my kneecaps. Nobody's like, Bobby, your kneecaps are out of control today. That has n- never happened. Uh, my nose has never gotten me in trouble other than it's a little bit crooked, but, other, it's never, but there's this one thing that has gotten me in trouble and my guess is it's gotten you in trouble. It's our tongues. Anybody gotten in trouble for something you've said? Cliff's hand came up quickly. I see the section, of, right? We have gotten in trouble for what we've said. We've called this weapons of mass destruction because honestly, it is the thing that's caused a lot of destruction. It is the thing that's caused a lot of drama. It's the thing that causes a lot of tension and it's crazy. You can do anything for the rest of your body. If, if your uh, blood pressure's up, and they give you medicine, get on the treadmill a little bit more every week. If, you're, if your cholesterol's up, hey, take these pills. If your gallbladder's out of control, hey, we're actually just going to take it out of your body. You don't even need it. But what do you do with this little thing called the tongue? The tongue. Every guy in the room knows what it's like to say the wrong thing in the wrong way, right? Every guy at least once in their life asks the question that, to, of a lady that you're never supposed to ask them. And the moment it's coming out of your mouth, you're like, I shouldn't be asking this, but it's too late to pull it back in. When's the baby do? do? And it's almost like when you get, Rick knows it well. Have you been guilty of this, Rick? Have you? Yeah. Do we need to pray for Rick right now? Would that be all right? But it's almost like when it's coming out of your mouth, you're trying to pull it back in. And as you're trying to pull it back in, it even gets louder. When's the baby do? (laughs) And it's too late at that point, right? And maybe you haven't said that, but maybe you've said something else. Haven't you said something that, that the moment it's coming out of your mouth, you're like, man, I wish I could just backtrack that. I wish I could just bring that in. I wish I could undo it, right? And this thing is so powerful. This thing is such a big deal that James, the half brother of Jesus, spends a chunk of his letter to talk about it. Can you imagine being the half brother of Jesus? Can you imagine what that was like? That's who James is. Can you imagine what that's like growing up in the home with Mary being your mother? Did you know that Jesus had brothers and sisters? Did you know that? Can you imagine what that's like? The pressure when you're in the living room having WWE Smackdown and your mother Mary walks in? And Mary's like, boys, cut it out. Boys, quit it. Why can't you be more like your brother, Jesus? (laughs) Uh, Well, he's God. (laughs) Oh, right. Go back to elbow smashing, right? And so James has this unique vantage point of seeing Jesus grow up, seeing the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And James becomes the first church leader in Jerusalem where it all went down. And he's so convinced by this that he begins to write about, here's how you activate your faith. Here's how you take your faith out of your head, into your heart and begin to live it out. And one of these areas that we have to learn that is how we use our tongues. And so if you've got a bulletin today, I'm going to invite you just to take some notes this morning. I want to be super practical. I wish there was a way I could teach every single verse in the chapter and time wise, we just can't do that. But what we can do is to say, are there some helps in this? 
Are there some practical handles we can put around this? Is there something we can apply from what James has to say and what God has to say about this? Can it make a difference in my day-to-day life? And that's my prayer is that we would be different because we've taken what God has said and we apply it to the details of our life. And one of those details is how we use our time. Let me pray for us this morning. We'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time for us to gather around your word. Thank you for people like James that give us such a practical way to live out our faith. Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for all my friends and for those that are watching online. Would you help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. I'm from Mississippi. That's the way you do it. So let's dive in. James chapter three, he writes about something that's a really big deal. In fact, in chapter one, this is such a big deal. He says in chapter one, we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak, which is totally opposite of how we're typically wired. Usually we we don't listen very well and the moment we think it, we say it and that's usually when we get in trouble. And maybe this sermon's just for me. Maybe I actually just need a mirror over here and just be watching myself. But man, what he says then down in chapter three is he talks about the power of the tongue. Listen to what he says in James chapter three. Let me look at verse two for a second. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. I'm thinking, no kidding. (laughs) This is, right. thank you, Dr. Obvious. We all stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, so here he is talking about our tongues, how we use our words. He says, and if you don't stumble in what you say, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. He's saying, this is a big deal. So principle number one, if we're gonna think about this idea of taming our tongue, is number one, we need to begin to analyze the ramifications. It's this idea of saying, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna think about the power of my words. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but your words carry weight. Your words carry uh, heaviness to them. Your words really do matter. And uh, the reason why I, I, I say we need to pause and analyze the ramifications is because I think a lot of times we don't appreciate how weighty our words actually are because we live in a society that has so many words around us. I mean, you go to Barnes and Noble and you see all the books. I mean, there's shelves after shelves after shelves. There's tables full of the discount ones. There's uh, multiple floors, multiple stories at Barnes and Noble. And then you get on Amazon and you, I've got like a thousand books on my Kindle. There's all kinds of words, all kinds of words, all kinds of words, all kinds of words. Then you get on the internet and you get on social media and you see word, 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 words. And the temptation is, when you're around so many words is you begin to underestimate the power of those words. You begin to forget that words carry weight. And I'll I'll say that again, especially to parents. If you're a parent, if you've got a kid, your words carry weight to those kiddos. If you're a boss, your words carry weight to the people that work with you and work for you. And your words, if you're a boss, actually don't just impact the people that you work with, they impact what they carry home with them. If you're a coach, your words carry weight. That's why we love our coaches. That's why we love our partnership with Lanier and, and, and all of our educators at Buford and North and just throughout our county, man, those words carry away. And if we're not careful, we'll forget it. If we're not careful, we'll take them for granted. And we need to remember the weight of the words. If you're taking notes underneath that first point, let me just give you some examples. This is not exhaustive, but let me give you some examples of what your words can do. The first one is A, your words can be destructive. They really can. Our words can be destructive. He says in verse five, he says, so also the tongue, it's a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. What James does is he uses object lesson after object lesson after object lesson to say, your tongue may be small, your tongue may be little, and maybe doesn't seem like a big deal, but small things really do make a big difference. He uses this illustration of a forest fire. He says a small spark creates a forest fire. And we remember two years ago, what happened in Gatlinburg. A small fire at a little campsite, coupled with 80 mile per hour wind, led to over 17,000 acres burned by a small fire. Led to over 14 people, or 14 people losing their lives, uh, uh, injuring a, another 190 more people, and it ended up costing over five, listen to this, over $500 million of damage. James is like, man, that's what the tongue does. 
Then he used the illustration of a rudder with a ship. He's like, man, a large ship is, is turned by a small rudder. And he used the illustration of animals. He's like, you can put a small bit in the mouth of a horse, but you can control this giant animal that has all of the strength. And he says, in the same way or in a similar way, that's your tongue. And if we're not careful, our tongues end up becoming destructive. It's small, but it's significant. And it begins, if we're not careful to tear things down, it begins to torch the lives of the people around us. And some of us carry some baggage from destructive uses of the tongue. Things that were said when we're small or things that were said in the heat of the moment. And we think, man, our words don't really matter. Oh yeah, they do matter. A, they're destructive. Here's the second thing that the tongue can do. B, is it creates distance. It creates distance. It can create distance between us and other people. The things that we've said. And, and for some of us, we're living this out where there's somebody we haven't talked to in weeks or months, maybe even years. Sometimes it's a friend, some, some, somebody that used to be a best friend and then something was said in the heat of the moment. Sometimes it's a family member, somebody that, that, that loved you the most and yet somewhere along the way, words got crossed and things got said that, that, that you can't undo and it torched that relationship. Sometimes it's even within marriages where, where there's spouses that don't know how to talk. They don't know how to be around each other when the kids aren't around because there's distance. He's saying this is powerful, it's destructive. It, it creates distance. Here's a third thing that the tongue can do. It can demonstrate our maturity. It can demonstrate our maturity. As James is talking, that phrase in verse two was, we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble, he's like, we all stumble, but if anyone doesn't stumble in what they say, he is a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. That word perfect means mature. It doesn't mean that you never make mistakes. It says you're growing up, that you're getting this. It's dropping out of your head into your heart. It's changing what you say. It demonstrates our maturity. People that are maturing in their faith, people that are activating their faith, they pay attention to what they say. They, they no longer play the victim card. They no longer say, well, that's just the way I'm wired. That's just my personality. I just say it, what it is, like it is. No, somebody that's growing in their faith begins to mature even in what they say. Here's another one. Here's what the tongue does. It actually creates destiny. It creates destiny. He says in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the, the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and it's set on fire by hell. He's talking about this power of the tongue. It reminds me that, that God himself used words to speak this world into creation. He used words to speak everything out of nothing into something. And in a similar way, our words carry weight like that. Our words can create destinies. Our words can cause something to happen, either for good or for harm. I mean, one of the things I love about our coaches is, man, God uses coaches like that to speak into a young player's life and to call out something that maybe they don't even see in themselves. Or sometimes God uses you as parents or as a grandparent to see beneath the surface and to look down at a, at a child or a grandchild and say, I see something special inside of you. It can create that destiny. I, I, I can't tell you what happens when somebody looks you in the eye and says, I see God at work in you. I see the man that God's created you to be. I see the woman that, they're, they're, it's almost like somebody when they hear those words, they stand up a little straighter. It's almost like the spark comes back to their eye, but the same way, it can be destructive. When I was a second grader, I was diagnosed or labeled as having a learning disability in the area of reading. And so uh, every day in elementary school or anytime we'd have reading class, I'd get pulled out of reading class and be taken to the little trailer behind the, the school for the remedial class. And man, I'm telling you, every time I got the report card, every six weeks, every six weeks, every six weeks, I look at that report card, with that report card, with that report card. And every time by reading the two letters, LD, learning disabilities label there, and I allowed those words to take root in my heart. And so whenever I would start thinking about uh, what's God doing in my life or how am I wired, I would see myself through a label that was spoken over me. I felt so dumb. I mean, when you're a third grader and you're taken to this uh, trailer behind the school, I was like, man, what do we have the combined IQ of a booger or something? I mean, I, I, I mean that's, <laughs> that's what you think is that? That's gross. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're the one wearing green, not me. 
because I forgot. I was, I was passing Husbandry 101 by getting ready in the dark this morning and totally, so I wouldn't wake up Laura and then totally forgot to wear green. So anyway, so I'll take my punishment later. But anyway, so I allowed this label to speak over me. Over the weekend, I traveled to my hometown in Olive Branch, Mississippi, and my pastor who led me to Christ, who baptized me, who ordained me into ministry, gave me my first job on a church staff. His wife threw a surprise party yesterday for celebrating 50 years in ministry for him. Unbelievable, 79 years old, super faithful, not perfect, but faithful. Not, not uh, without, uh, uh, you know, just a normal human guy that God used in my life to speak words into my life as a high schooler that created life inside of me. We need to analyze the ramifications. Our words have weight, our words have power, our words matter. So number one, principle number one, if we're gonna try to think about this idea of taming the tongue is we need to analyze the ramifications. Don't take it for granted. Don't, don't be flipping about it. Don't say stuff that, that, that wants us out there torches somebody else's life. Number one, analyze the ramification. Principle number two is we need to allow for recreation in our tongues. Now that seems a little odd at first, but let me tell you why I think there's so much tension in our tongues is we haven't allowed God to recreate them. James, as he's writing, he, he calls out this tension that I think all of us have felt. He says in verse nine, he says, with our tongues, do you see this? Verse nine, with our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Do you see that tension? He's like, one minute we're blessing God. One minute we're like, God, you're amazing. God, you're awesome. God, you're unbelievable. It's your breath in my lungs. All right, we sing all of these songs. He's like, one minute we're blessing God, and then the next minute we're cursing men. And I think all of us have lived there before, where, where, where it's easy to come into a room like this on a Sunday morning and, and be lifted up and to focus our heads and hearts on God. And then just moments later, we're stuck at the light at 20 and we're like, who's the knucklehead in front of me? The light was green for 10 seconds before they actually hit the, or is this just me that actually fills these things? <laughs> Jimmy, is that you too? You're getting pointed at. Again, maybe you should pray for one of your pastors today, right? But one minute we're like, God, you're amazing. God, you're awesome. Everything we have comes from you. And then we're at lunch 30 minutes later. And if they don't bring it just right at just the right moment, we go off. All right, like, we can't believe these people. Would you just write down my order instead of trying to impress me with your memory? Or is that just me? <laughs> just write it down. I like you already. I'm going to tip you good. Just write it down. Get it right. Right. And James is like, why is there this disconnect? In fact, listen to the way he talks about it. Verse 10, from the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. And he says this, my brothers, these things ought not be so. It's like, this, this isn't what active faith looks like. This is not what living this thing out looks like. This, he's saying this is broken in all of us. That we've all, at some point or another, we've done this. At some point or another, we, one minute we're like, God, I love you. God, I, I, I want to know you more. God, I want to grow in my faith. And then the next minute, we're using that same tongue to, to curse somebody or something else. And James says, it should not be so. And the question is, why does that happen? There's a lot of reasons why I think it happens. But one of the big reasons is because at the moment of salvation, the moment we put our faith in Jesus, something happens on the inside of us. It literally does. Jesus steps out of heaven. He steps into our heart. He starts changing us from the inside out. He changes our heart. He changes where our focus is. But what I found is that internal change takes time to leak its way out into every area of our lives. Another way of thinking about this is if we're not dead, then God's not done with changing us from the inside out. If we still have breath in our lungs, if we're still on this earth, God is not done changing us from the inside. The goal is the longer we live, the more like Jesus we'd become. The longer we live, that change that started in our heart would eventually leak its way out into the thoughts that we have. 
It would leak its way out into the appetites, the things that we look for in this life. And eventually it would leak its way out in the things that we say. And so the reason why this tension exists for a lot of us and the reason why there's so much drama, pain, and heartache is because we've allowed God to recreate where we're going to spend eternity. We've allowed God to recreate some of our past. God, would you forgive me of uh, all, all the sins I've, I've, I've done? But for many of us, we haven't allowed him to recreate the way that we speak. And James says... It shouldn't be that way. Let me give you some practical examples, again, of areas that I think we struggle with this. One of these areas is in the area of complaining. In the area of complaining. We're all prone to it. Uh, I was reading this recently uh, in the Old Testament. God delivered the nation of Israel. God, God delivered them from slavery, from Pharaoh. He provided them food from heaven. He provided them direction. He parted the Red Sea. He gave them water out of a rock. And yet, at the end of the day, they whined, they griped, they complained. And man, we've been guilty of that, haven't we? We start complaining about, man, I had to park so far away from the gym for me to walk in and work out. The kids are late again. The music is loud again. I'm not married. I thought I'd be married by now. I'm in another meeting. If I have to sit in another meeting, I'm going to poke my eye out with this pen. We complain. My, my boss, man, they got to get it together. My house is too small. My money is tight. Can you believe this? And we just begin to complain, complain, complain. Sometimes it's bigger stuff. Sometimes, honestly, it's little stuff. Sometimes it's the small things. It's like, man, if it keeps raining like this, Noah's going to show up. Man, this Wi-Fi is slow today. I've run out of things to binge watch on Netflix. This is a big problem. Again, this may just be me. <laughs> Pray for your pastor. No, not, not just me. Aaron says he's in it too. But here's the problem with complaining, or one of the problems with complaining, is when you complain enough, your brain becomes hardwired to complain even more. There's a little psychological principle that I think is true is you get more of what you expect. Sort of like when you buy a new car, before you bought the car, you didn't, never saw them on the road and now they are everywhere. They're everywhere. Well, that's the way complaining can work. If you expect to find something negative to go off about, you're gonna find it. You're gonna find more of it. And if we're not careful, that becomes a disconnect between our tongues and our hearts. And he says, this shouldn't be so. So complaining is a great area. Here's another area that I think this is super practical in the area of criticism. Criticism is rarely helpful. And, and I'll make a difference. There is a difference between constructive criticism and destructive criticism. So I'm talking about destructive criticism where you're belittling somebody or you're nagging them. That's rarely helpful. It's not helpful. And what's, what's, what's hard about criticism is it's very difficult to see in the mirror. We see it in other people, but it's hard to see in ourselves. And what ends up happening when we criticize people is we, we make these overarching statements of how they're always this way. Here's some of the ones I wrote in my notes. Uh, the, uh, how they dress all the time or how they post online or how they drive or how they spend their money or how they raise their kids. And we criticize, 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 nag, 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 belittle, belittle, belittle. And here's the truth. You don't actually know what's going on in their life. Whenever I criticize somebody, I'm assuming I know the whole story, and that is not true. And what I found, at least for myself, is out of time, a lot of times criticism is coming from a place of insecurity in my own life. And I'm projecting it on somebody else. And so what ends up happening is we tend to criticize in others what we're most insecure about in ourselves. And James is like, this shouldn't be so. So complaining, criticism. Here, here's another area that this comes up. Lying. I was my mind was blown by this when I looked at the research. Research shows that we tell lies on an average of four times a day. How many of you have already lied today? Have you lied? Isn't that crazy? The study shows that 60% of people cannot have a 10 minute conversation without lying. And sometimes we justify it because it's not, sometimes it's, well, uh, you know, I, I just want to avoid conflict. So I just want to get out of the conversation or uh, uh, I want to get away with something or I'm just trying to be nice or I'm trying to, you know, spin it on this positive deal. But at the end of it, the most dangerous lies that we tell are the ones that we tell ourselves when we act like it's not a big deal because what happens over time, if you lie enough, there's this disconnect with your heart and you end up playing this victim game. Here's the last one I'll mention. There's so many more, but here's another practical area that this applies to is the area of gossip. 
gossip. How many of you know somebody that gossips? Do you know somebody that gossips? Do you want to talk about them while they're not here? (laughs) That would be wrong. Gossip is so subtle. Again, it's easy to see in somebody else. It's harder to see in the mirror. It begins to sneak its way. Sometimes we even disguise it. Well, it's just a prayer request. I want you to know how to pray for them. It becomes just this thing that you pass on upon. And here's the truth that I've learned is that everything we say must be true. That's right. Everything we say must be true, but not everything that's true actually needs to be said. Amen. <laughs> Where were you at 930? I needed you at night. Can we record that and just have it on a little button? Everything that is said must be true but not everything that's true must be said. You don't have to say everything you're thinking. You don't even have to say everything that's true. And we'll talk about more of that in just a minute. But uh, man, he, this is so, so practical. This is so, so practical to say, you know what? We need to tame our tongue. We need to tame our tongue. We need it. Why? Because the ramifications, they're big. The small thing that causes big damage. Number two, to begin to allow recreation. God, the same God that recreated me on the inside, would you recreate the way that I use my tongue? Would you change my speech? Principle number three is a big one to say, I need to apply God's resources to my tongue. I need to apply God's resources to my speech. And so again, I wish we could read the whole chapter, but listen to what James says down in verse 13. He says, who is wise and who is understanding among you? He's asking this this question. He's like, Is there anybody wise? Is there anybody that has understanding? He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. Not weakness and meekness, bridled, under control. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy, if you have selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. He says in verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's even, listen to this word, it's even demonic. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. We've all seen that. We've seen tension, we've seen drama, we've seen sideways energy, we've seen fights that shouldn't have existed. We've seen unclarity uh, uh, grow in these moments. He's saying this is not what it's supposed to be. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, it's then peaceable, it is gentle, it's open to reason, it's full of mercy. Do you see that? Full of mercy. Instead of judgment, full of mercy, good fruits, it's impartial, it's sincere. He's saying this is what we need to apply to our speech. Not, can I get away with it? Not, can I even the playing field? Can I go off? But can I take these resources from God and apply them to my speech. And this is, th- this is so hard. Um, on, on this next slide, uh, before you guys put it up, let me just sort of set it up. This next slide uh, has some principles. It's got some questions and there's no way uh, you could quickly write them all down. And so if you wanna take a picture of them, I'd invite you to do that. Um, If you're a social media kind of person, this may be a way of spreading the word of this to take a picture and post it somewhere and hashtag SHC James, hashtag SHC James. But let me just rattle these off to apply God. What does that look like? Applying God's wisdom to our conversation. Here's the question I ask myself often. Is this what Jesus would say? If Jesus was right here in this conversation, is this what he would say? Would he he act this way? Because so many people that say that they follow Jesus don't really act like him in their conversation. So I'm like, man, would Jesus say this? Here's a, a principle. Repeat only what you know to be true. Sometimes we hear something and then we repeat it and then that gets repeated and it's almost like, what was the game as a kid? Telephone, do you remember that? Where you'd line up like 30 kids, you'd whisper on one end, and they'd whisper and whisper, and whisper, and by the time we get to the other end, it's totally different. And I've just learned that, man, I, I need to make sure what I'm repeating is actually true. Here's the third one. Don't interpret situations. Don't interpret situations. So often we put ourselves in the seat of a judge where when we see something or we hear something, we assume we know the whole story. 
and we place judgment. And here's what I found. Once you place judgment on somebody, you remove any other options from the table. Uh, you're, you're filling the gap with uh, judgment instead of trust. You're filling the gap between what you know and what's actually true with something negative. So don't interpret, don't read into it. Here's the next one. Uh, you need to know when not to press something. You need to know when not to press something. In other words, Ephesians 5 refers to the fact that we can actually quench the spirit by how we speak. And so what you find through all the research with emotional intelligence, and that's a big deal in our culture, that it seems like more and more people are aware of this, that, that we need to read moments. And there are times when you need to speak directly to somebody about something. And honestly, there are times that if you say it in that moment, it's not gonna be well received. Because it's not just what we say, but it's how we say it that conveys the message. And there are times that you just need to know, man, I need to back off of this. I, I, I need to sit back on this. I need, to, I need to sit on this and wait for a better time for this. Here's another principle. Don't fall into judgmental conversations. We already sort of hit on this, but the moment you cast judgment on somebody, you've removed the other options. You, 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 you start playing, you start completing the sentence in your mind of how awful they are. And it removes the possibility for there to be any healing in that. Here's the next one. Use your words to encourage and inspire. Use your words to encourage and inspire. Doesn't it feel good when somebody uses words to encourage and inspire you? to look somebody in the eye and say, man, I see what God is up to. It's so powerful. Here's another principle. Never say anything about someone that you couldn't say in front of them. Oftentimes when somebody's not in the room, we say things so much bolder, so much heavier than it actually is. Could you say it as if they're in the room? And here's the last one. There's so many more we could talk about and I may do a post this week. But is what I'm about to say going to actually benefit people? Is it going to benefit people? Is it going to build them up? Is it going to be helpful? And, and this is the mindset of shifting from being a judge where I'm casting judgment to becoming more like a physician that's trying to treat a symptom. When I'm a judgmental, I'm, I'm looking at it black and right, white, right or wrong, in or out, but when I'm thinking more like a doctor, instead of casting judgment, I'm trying to bring healing to this relationship. This is saying, God, I wanna take your wisdom and apply it. Do you see how practical this is? So James says, man, we've gotta be quick to listen and slow to speak. We've gotta to learn to bridle this thing. How do I do that? Analyze the ramifications, my words have weight allow recreation. I'm going to allow the change that's happening here to change the way I speak. Apply God's resources. Say, God, I want to take your wisdom, which is why I think it's so important to spend time in God's word every single day and to take that wisdom and apply it to the way we speak. And then here's the last principle. Principle number four, anticipate God's righteousness. Anticipate God's righteousness. Honestly, it would be so easy to talk about all the negative things that happen because of our tongue. I mean, that's where I've hung out for the most part because I think we've all felt that tension. But listen to what it says in verse 18. James says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know what the principle is? The principle is this, righteousness increases when right things are spoken. Your words have weight, your words have power. And so many times people are known for what they point out that's wrong. They're known for being gossips, complainers, people that are criticizing people, right? Too often we're known for the negative side of the tongue, but what would happen, can you imagine what it would be like instead of being known for all the things that you're against in somebody's life, what if you became known for what you're for them? Can you imagine what that would do in your relationship with your coworkers instead of there being judgment and this, this tension where they recognize, man, I am for you. I want you to succeed. I want you to be the best person in this position that you could be so that you can advance, so that you can be happy, so that you can find your fulfillment and your family will know that. Can you imagine how different the, your relationship with your kids would be? Instead of picking apart, well, I can't believe your room is always messy, that you would shift and say, but my kid has a soft heart. 
instead of picking apart your spouse and say, well, they're not very organized and say, but they are such a loving mate and my and partner in my walk. Instead of always going off, man, my boss, my boss, my boss, and we would flip that script and say, but man, what is a, what a blessing to have somebody that knows where we're going and what we're doing. Can you imagine what would happen if instead of being known as somebody that plays the victim card all the time and we go off on social media all the time and we lose our temper all the time, can you imagine if instead of being known as somebody that quenches people through our words, that we would be known as somebody that gives hope to the people around us, that we would be a hope dealer and that we'd look people in the eye and we'd allow the positive side of this powerful thing called the tongue to create something inside of them that they didn't even see coming. Can you imagine looking your son or your daughter, your grandson or granddaughter in the eye and saying, I love you. I'm so proud of you. You've got what it takes. You're gonna be an incredible young man. You're gonna be an incredible young lady. Can you imagine how powerful it would be to look at your spouse and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I haven't filtered this. I'm sorry that, that I've torched this relationship. Can you imagine how it'd be to, to, to send a text to that person that you haven't talked to in weeks, months, or years because of some silly misunderstanding, some, some maybe even email that was misread, and to say, you know what, I, I, I'm so, so sorry. I don't even remember why this thing exists, but I just wanna say I'm sorry. I miss you in my life. Can you imagine the weight that would be lifted off of you? and the life that you can bring to this world if you and I practiced taming our tongue. Would you bow with me this morning? Would you close your eyes? I'd love to pray for us because I'm telling you, this is such a practical thing that all of us deal with. All of us deal with. And today as we pray, I just wonder if there's anybody in the house today that would just say, Bobby, as you pray, pray for me because I want to be a person that applies God's wisdom to my speech. I wanna be a person that becomes a hope dealer. I wanna become a person that calls out the best. I wanna be a person that uses their tongue for good and not for harm. If that's you, and you just be honest about that, just say, hey, this is an area I wanna grow in, myself included. If that's you, would you slip your hand quietly in the area? Just say, Bobby, pray for me, man, pray for me. I'd love to grow in this, yeah. Some of us are like, man, I just got a critical spirit. I wanna grow. I've torn people down, I wanna grow. Maybe God brought a relationship to mind that's been torched by the flame of your tongue. And maybe you just wanna pray even now, God, would you help me to know what to do? God, would you help me know what to do? Maybe it is saying I'm sorry. Maybe it is saying I forgive you. Maybe it's the simple three words, I love you. Maybe it's as simple as saying, I'm listening to you. I'm proud of you. But would you just ask God, God, would you help me to know how to apply this? The thing that I know is that it's not really a tongue problem. It's always a heart problem. It starts with our hearts. And the only hope that any of us have in taming our tongue, and James, honestly, if you read chapter three on your own, there's not a lot of hope in chapter three, but the only hope that I know of is for us to surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus. The only way that any of us could be changed from the inside out is to allow him to step out of heaven and step into our hearts. So if that's never happened for you, this is where this all begins. It's this realization, I can't do this, but God, I know that you can. God, I can't fix this, but I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know you're alive today and as best as I know how, I ask you to save me and change me and help me to live for you. If you've never done that, there's nothing magical about the words, but there's something powerful about that heart of surrender. So maybe even now as I pray out loud, you wanna pray silently in your head and your heart. If you're watching online or listening to the podcast, you can do this and say, dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. but I believe you died on the cross for my sins and I believe you're alive today. And as best as I know how, 
I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save me. Help me to live for you. And if you just prayed that part of the prayer with me for the very first time, I'd love to know that. You can put it on one of the info cards on the back side. There's a place for prayer requests. You can swing by the meet and greet room. Our team is there. But we'd love to celebrate that with you and give you some resources to help you take that next step. But for all of us, maybe you wanna pray this part of the prayer. Dear Jesus, would you recreate the way that I use my tongue? Would you help me to use my tongue for life instead of death? That it bring healing and hope instead of destruction and death. And God, we don't know how, it's not always gonna be easy. But would you help us to bridge the gap between what we believe and what we say. Help us to activate our faith. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to give you two quick applications on your way out today. One is, as we start getting ready for Easter, we're just a few short weeks away. We really are, we're just a few short weeks away. And some people, as they prepare for Easter, they intentionally choose to fast from something. The word fast from the Old Testament literally means to cover your mouth. And so a lot of times when people think about fasting, they think about not eating for a certain period of time. Maybe they cut out a thing like coffee. I can't do that, that would be dangerous. Uh, sometimes they cut out meals for a certain period of time during the day so that when they feel the hunger pains, it's this reminder to focus their heads and their hearts on Jesus. Some people fast from social media or they fast from something else. What would happen if for the next 40 days or maybe even just the next seven days, what if we chose to say, I'm gonna fast from critical words. I'm gonna fast from gossip. I'm gonna fast from anything that would be destructive, that we, instead of doing a food fast, a social media fast, a, 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 a treat fast, whatever fast, that we would say, I'm gonna do a word fast and I'm gonna guard my words as best as I can. And every single time I start to think it, that I would allow God and say, God, would you recreate that thought inside of me? That would be a great thing to consider. Would you consider perhaps doing a word fast this week or maybe this month? A second application is, as you know, we love serving people here in our community and around the world. One of our partners is an organization called Convoy of Hope. You've heard us talk about them, but even if you haven't heard us talk about them, CNN writes them up, all the newspapers write them up all the time because they are first responders. Anytime there's a natural disaster, tornadoes in Alabama, Convoy of Hope is boots on the ground. Tornadoes in Florida or uh, hurricanes in Florida, they're on the ground. Uh, world disasters, they're overseas, they're around the world. And so one of the things we wanna do is we wanna partner with them and put together what's just a simple little hygiene kit for those that are caught in the middle of an emergency. When families are displaced from their homes, when, when they, their, their lives are disrupted by whatever that natural disaster is, their whole lives are turned upside down. And a simple thing as a 10 or $12 kit that we put together, could make all the difference in those families finding their new normal. And so I wanna encourage you, there's a table on your way out today with Susan Roebuck where she's given out bags and then a shopping list. There's very specific items. It's not just put random stuff in there, but there's specific items that would bless these families. And so my prayer is one way that we'd activate our faith is say, you know what? I can take 10 or 12 bucks and I'll put together one of these and I'll bring them back over the next two weeks and know that when you do that, you bless other people. Well, hey, I'm so grateful you're here today. Pastor Chuck is back with us next Sunday with James chapter five. It's already, I've already looked at his notes. It's gonna be unbelievable. If you wanna invite a friend, this would be a great week to invite them. But we love you guys. We hope you have a great rest of your Sunday that you actually enjoy the sun today. And man, we are so honored to get to worship with you and call you family. Hope you have a great day. Love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.